Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's free public webinar with TPC training entitled A Crash Course on How to Read Electrical Schematics. My name is Ryan Smith, product manager here with TPC training, and we are joined by one of our expert instructors, Marty Redman, uh, expert here on uh, electrical schematics, and it's going to tell us all about uh, the different types of electrical schematics, so some of the symbols we might see in the field, and really just just some really applied knowledge on reading schematics for this little hour free session we got here today. So um, before we jump into the presentation, I really wanted to let everyone know that today's session is being recorded and the recording video of this uh, webinar will be up on our website, uh, the DPC training website, and will be sent to you in an email uh, within about two business days after the completion of this webinar. So be on the lookout for that. Also, the PDFs of these slides will be available for you on that same website for you to download and share with your coworkers. And finally, this session is live right now. And so because of that, let's interact. Let's uh, ask some questions for Marty um, and we'll be able to get to them at the end, uh, end of the uh, session here. So to do so, um, you'll see your kind of toolbar at the bottom that has some options there. At the bottom of the toolbar, you'll see something called Q&A. And when you click that Q&A button, it'll bring up a little window that gives you the opportunity to type in a question. Um, go ahead and type in that question and it's going to come right to us here on the panel and Marty and we'll be able to answer those questions uh, at the end of the session. So definitely feel free to use those. We look forward to answering and, and having this open discussion with everyone here. So as we get into talking about electrical schematics, I'd like to learn a little bit about who's here and who's tuning in. Uh, so we got a couple really quick intro poll, uh, introduction poll questions for you. And so what you're gonna see showing up on your screen right about now, right about now, you should see a window popping up somewhere on your screen that has two questions. Uh, just asking you about your experiences with electrical schematics. And what you can do is that, uh, click on the answer and it should register your answer for both questions and then submit when you're done with the question, uh, with the poll. So the first question is, how easy is it to find electrical schematics for equipment at your facility? Would you say it's very easy? Would you say it's easy? Would you say it's you're neutral about it, neither here nor there, that it's difficult to find schematics or is it very difficult to find schematics in your facility? We're getting some great answers coming in. And then the second question is, how comfortable are you in your ability to read and understand electrical schematics? And you can be honest, right? Um, very comfortable, are you comfortable? Are you neutral? Are you more uncomfortable or very uncomfortable reading electrical schematics and kind of understanding what's going on on them? So we're getting some really good results coming in here. I'll give you maybe just a few more moments to um, get your answers in. And if that poll didn't pop up for you, no problem. We'll share the results with you after this webinar. So uh, looks like the questions are evening out for the most part. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll now. And I'm gonna share the results with you. So what you should see now is a um, window popping up with the results of today's poll. So we, we can see, and what we do find is, is these same results out in the field is the the um, availability of schematics is all across the board. And so is this skill level on understanding how to read schematics. It's all across the board. So right in the middle of the road, um, we have neutral as an answer really. So, so kind of neither here nor there on how easy they are to find. So uh, thankfully, um, the so 40% of people are neutral to that, but 35% looks like uh, they're easy to find. So if you know where to go look for them, whether it's in the uh, you know engineering binder in your maintenance office or in some sort of electronic format on a shared drive, you can get to them easily. And some of you, about 16% of you are finding that it is difficult to find them. So definitely one action item um, we, we find is making sure you know where to find your schematics. And then finally, uh, how comfortable are you with your ability to read schematics? The answers are all across the board. Uh, some of you, 28% of you are comfortable, 34% of you are neutral, and 
25% of you are uncomfortable. So really it, it kind of goes all across the map. And so that, that's really good for us to know um, for Marty as we're getting started here is, you know, that there's all sorts of skill levels being represented here on the session. So go ahead and feel free to press the X button and close out the poll results on your screen. And uh, now we can start learning really more about the ins and outs of some of these electrical schematics. So Marty, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, just let everybody know that uh, I've been in the electrical field for over 40 years and have been with TPC training for over 14 years. So um, we understand a lot about what you're going through when it uh, comes to prints uh, and the difficulty in getting them, uh, the difficulty in the fact that uh, it seems like every print that uh, you may get uh, is different, has different symbols, has different numbering schemes. And so uh, uh, it's an opportunity, I guess, for us to uh, try to better understand prints, know where to look for that information. And uh, that way we can uh, better troubleshoot and, and do it safely because we can read the prints and, and we know what's going on in that particular piece of equipment or on a production line or, or whatever you may be in. So <laughs> there's some things that uh, you know we need to know. And uh, so as we uh, go through, we, we start talking about uh, things we need to understand, uh, understanding how electricity works. That seems like something very simple, but uh, you'd be surprised how many people really don't understand it and how it works. And we kind of need to know how it works so that we can use the drawing to the fullest extent. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we have all different types of drawings. So depending on what the skill set uh, is, uh, depends on the drawings. The symbols and abbreviations, uh, that's always been a hard thing because uh, depending on the engineering company, uh, the machine company or whatever, symbols and abbreviations aren't always the same. So we'll talk a little bit about those too. Uh, understanding how devices operate. This is something that uh, in the field, we need to know more about the devices, whether that's a motor starter or whether that's a VFD drive or just something as simple as uh, push buttons or three position selector switches, it's very important that we understand how that device should work. Uh, so, Because we're, we're going to want to kind of troubleshoot it. And if I don't know what a good one is, uh, it's going to be a little harder to determine whether it's bad or not. So we need to know a lot about the devices uh, that are on that piece of equipment uh, to help us troubleshoot. If you do have prints, which some of you do in your machinery, uh, you know, we need to look at that title block on there because that's going to give us a lot of information uh, about that machine. So a lot of those uh, are down that title block area. We're going to have notes and updates to those drawings, and they typically have numbers or triangles or clouds or something to distinguish where things have changed. And so if something's changed, we should go out there and look at that to make sure it hasn't affected what we are doing or what we're thinking about. So. We, we need to know a little bit more about those. And uh, we have a lot of machinery now that uh, comes from foreign countries. And some of the drawings for those machinery are done with uh, IEC or International Electrical Commission drawings uh, versus NEMA, which we're used to in the United States. And so um, if you don't know the key on how to read those drawings, it makes it more difficult. So there again, we have lots of opportunities uh, to spend some time learning about all of these drawings. And, uh, and then when you don't have drawings, that that's, uh, makes it a little tougher. So um, I know that uh, if you were to come to one of our schematics classes, uh, we actually teach you how to make a drawing if you don't have a print. And with most machinery, uh, it seems like the area that's a problem is usually the area all the time. It's usually the same place most of the time. So we can make a drawing of just part of the machine to make it easy for us to troubleshoot. And that's what we're after is to uh, keep production up, keep people safe. So we go through some of these things. Understanding how electricity works. So very important to understand uh, where my source of energy comes from. Most drawings are gonna show me that. Uh, most drawings are gonna indicate where that is, but Many, many pieces of equipment, 
many panels have many sources. They may have three or four sources. I, and those, those should be marked on the front of that panel to let me know how many sources I have. It could be coming from a backup generator. I don't know. Uh, but I need to know where that source is because usually at that source, that's where my overcurrent protection device is. Uh, and I need to know how to turn the power off to that machine if I need to get into that machine to repair something. Um, a lot of people, and I've seen it done many times, uh, they're following a conduit back someplace uh, to try to find out where the uh, overcurrent protection device, the breaker or, or distribution panel or whatever uh, is that's feeding that piece of equipment. And they go back there and they, you know, turn the disconnect off and they check, yep, got no power and that's it. When they get done, they never identify anything. They don't mark it. So when you take the time to find something, make sure you identify it so that everybody gets to know where it's at, just, just not the person, uh, just not you. So we need to know where those sources are and control power doesn't always come from the same panel. It might come from a different panel, a different source. So always make sure that you understand that just because I turned a disconnect off and locked it off doesn't mean that there's not power inside that panel. And the drawings, if you have good drawings, should show you that. The other part of our circuit is that we have a load. A load is usually something that does work for us. It could be as simple as a pilot light or it could be a three phase motor. Uh, but I need to know what that is and I need to know how it works. Back to my devices, I need to understand how they function uh, because the drawing and the symbols on there are gonna give me some information and I need to know what that is. Uh, then we get to our current flow, of, our flow of electrons through that circuit. Um, very important because I may not have the over, correct overcurrent protection device. Somebody could have changed the fuses. Um, it's very important to know what, what that current should be for that particular load. And so that I know I have the correct size wires and uh, all the information I need to do this is in the National Electrical Code. So that's where I get information. If you're doing motors, Article 430 is all about motors. It gives you all the information you need uh, to understand motors and overloads and all those things. And same way with our path, our wires that we're using to complete that path to all those devices, they have to be sized properly. And obviously if I go to the code, we don't even call them wires. It's not even in there, they're conductors. And so, we need to, to know what those are, because when I get on a print, there's not going to be any wire sizes on, on most control drawings. They're just, they're just drawings, lines that take me to show me that path that the current's supposed to take. So I don't know what that is. There'll be another drawing someplace that's going to give me that information, but it's probably not going to be the control drawing that I'm on. So very important to understand how the path works what I have to have in a circuit to go. And so I can follow that through my drawings. Uh, here we just have a list of, of several different uh, types of drawings. Most of you I'm sure are probably familiar with a single line drawing uh, that we have and typically shows us our main distribution in a facility. Uh, and those voltages could range anywhere from you know, 120 all the way up to 4160. It just depends on what you're doing in your facility. But a single line diagram means we use one line to indicate where the path goes. Instead of three, three lines would just kind of mess up the drawing a little bit. So we call it a single line because we use one line. We show uh, symbols of disconnects or fuses or whatever in there. It gives us that opportunity to know where things are going. So if you're in a facility, uh, typically your one line diagram has a numbering scheme to it. Uh, not all of them do, but most of them do. And in that scheme is always trying to get you back to the source. So if I have a lighting panel out in the middle of the facility, the number on it is gonna be somehow associated typically with the breaker or overcurrent protection device that feeds that panel. And it's always going to try to get me back to the source. And, and that's what we do with distribution. So uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of you probably don't have uh, someone that keeps that up to date. 
uh, as we change things in a facility and move pieces of equipment around, uh, a lot of companies don't have that person that keeps that up to date. And before you know it, it's very outdated. And that's a bad thing because that's a safety problem. And I can tell you that OSHA can find you uh, if your one line diagrams are not up to date. Because like I said, it's a safety issue. If you have a, a distribution breaker turned on uh, and is drawing current, but there's nothing on there that identifies it, that's a problem. That's, that's a problem because people don't know what to turn off or what it's for. So uh, try, to, try to keep up with your uh, installations in the facility. If you got an engineer, that's really great. That definitely helps. Our wiring diagrams that uh, show uh, locations of terminations and stuff. Some of you may have them on prints. Some of you may not. It just, uh, it really depends on the manufacturer, the machine, or the engineering company. Uh, a schematic diagram says here, electrical operation, kind of showing you where the relays are and how things are connected. Um, ladder diagrams are something that probably most of us have for most equipment. Uh, that's in a, an industrial facility. And typically the reason we use that for controls is that it just shows us the path the current has to take to energize the load. It, it doesn't care where it's at. Could be two feet apart, could be 200 feet apart, doesn't really matter. It's just showing us the path, what has to be closed on that line to make that load energize. So it's a very simple drawing. Uh, floor plan basically show it's at. Maybe you got a motor control center. Where is it at? That that print is going to show you where those things are, are where the panels are in the facility. So um, all these different drawings are for different things. And then we have a site plan that kind of locates, you know, where the power is coming in, and if you have transformers and uh, those kind of things, where they sit on your property and how the facility sits in there. So we have a lot of different drawings. Uh, that help us find the things we need. Uh, unfortunately, if you don't have an engineer to keep these up to date, uh, we have things that we put in and we don't have a record of any of it other than it's there and it's working. So that's a problem, uh, but you can overcome it. It just, it just takes time to get things uh, down on paper someplace when you have time. Uh, and, you know, if you uh, haven't had much time to go over drawings like a single line. You know, when you have time in the break room or something, get those drawings out and put them up on the table and, and spend some time going over that and try to figure out what numbers mean and what symbols are so that the day you need it, you know. You know, it just got it, you got to check things out. Symbols. I wish I could tell you that uh, uh, symbols are all the same in all the drawings, but they're not. Um, everybody seems to have a better mousetrap, I guess. And so we have lots of different ones. I would tell you that uh, probably since the 90s anyhow, uh, we've gotten better at that because of automated uh, CAD drawings and uh, these CAN packages they have for symbols. So I think more of engineering companies try to use the same symbols uh, and that makes it easier for, for you. Uh, but with all the different disciplines of drawings, uh, architectural, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, civil, whatever it may be, they all have their own set of symbols and abbreviations. So if you can only imagine what that is, that, that is an awful lot to keep in your brain uh, to know what they all are. And uh, that's, that's just about impossible, I guess, but uh, some of you may be able to do it. So one of the things that should help us, um, is that uh, most drawings, at least when they were new, uh, have a legend sheet. And the engineering company uh, draws every symbol that's in that drawing on that sheet and explains what that symbol means. So if you don't have that sheet, it makes it a little tougher to figure out. Um, keep in mind that uh, since the 90s, most drawings have been on CAD, AutoCAD, and so for a lot of you, you could probably go back to the manufacturer of your equipment or the production line or whatever, and you might be able to obtain a uh, new electronic drawing. Uh, you may have changed them a little bit, but they'll probably be 90, 80% right 
uh, that's a lot better than not having any drawings. So uh, there is information typically there for you, uh, but you got to spend time there reading it. And uh, the downside, I guess, is that a lot of times we don't get drawings out until we just got no place else to turn to. And then we get the drawings out and we don't understand the symbols because we just haven't been there. We haven't had time to figure that drawing out. So again, when you have time, get them out and try to look through them and try to get that understanding uh, of what that uh, engineer meant as he was going through there. Uh, <clears throat> Symbols are something, you know, we look at, been doing that for what, thousands and thousands of years, people that are drawing pictures and things to try to get us to understand what they mean. And so uh, with all these different disciplines, we've got the same thing, but we have to understand that uh, if we're gonna use that drawing to troubleshoot, we have to be able to understand what the symbols are because I don't know if you've ever tried to write down off a drawing how many words there are on the drawing, but there's not many words. So you're not gonna get much meaning unless you truly understand the symbols, okay? So uh, symbols are something that uh, there's a lot of books that have symbols. You can go to the web and get symbols. There's just a lot of different places that can help you depending on what has happened, okay, o over the years. So. Uh, Try to get those and get them understand. When we get into uh, machinery, uh, typically we have symbols for power and we have symbols for control. Uh, depending on how large the machine is, um, you may have all the controls on one set of prints and all the power on another set. So you might have two or three pages that are just power and several pages that are the controls. And uh, through a numbering scheme, they link everything together significant numbering systems. So uh, down below here, we have some symbols, uh, some basic power symbols. And, and our first one there is a, a fuse disconnect switch. And beside it, we have a little auxiliary contact um, because uh, we need to know whether that switch is closed or open. And the, the circuit for our controls need to know that's happened and Many of you have HMI systems now that give us a lot of information. We, we can do a lot of troubleshooting from HI and HMI system now. Uh, don't even have to get a meter out. And a lot of them tell you exactly what's wrong. And so we have auxiliary contacts to give us information and say, yeah, that switch is closed. Uh, does that mean the fuses uh, are good? No, it doesn't mean that, but it just means that it is closed. And, and that's important to know because especially in production lines now where uh, a lot of machines have two disconnects for a motor. They may have a disconnect back in the motor control center uh, on the MCC bucket, and they may have another disconnect, uh, non-fused disconnect out at right next to the motor. So we can lock it out right next to the motor uh, and we know nobody's gonna turn it on on us. So when I have auxiliary disconnects in there, that tells the circuitry, that they're open and will not let somebody close the motor starter contactor and put power out to that disconnect next to that motor I'm working on. Because I do not wanna turn that disconnect on and have that motor come on. Uh, lots of bad things can happen. So we have all of these contacts to give us that information and they'll be on your, on your power drawings, but they'll probably have numbers on them. So uh, when we start looking at uh, uh, our auxiliary contact here, there'll be a number that tells me where those wires go to another page, to another print, uh, something to let me know how that is hooked into the control circuit. Uh, our next uh, symbol over here is a non-fused disconnect switch. So this would be one like next to that motor. The first one might've been in the disconnect. This one could be right next to the motor. I don't need to fuse it because I already have the overcurrent protection in the motor starter bucket and also has an auxiliary so that I know when it's open or closed. These typically are lights that show up on an HMI system. As soon as the operator looks, he can say, oh, we didn't, you know, they worked on it. They unlocked it, but they must have forgot to close it. So the reason it won't start up is because the disconnect switch is open. So our next symbol is a contactor. This is a three-phase contactor. <coughs> and 
Uh, we use contactors for lots of different things. Uh, lighting. Uh, some contactors are in front of VFDs. We just use them all over the place because they can handle current. So this symbol here is just showing me uh, a three-phase contactor. The last one, back to our overloads, uh, are, are letting us know that uh, we have three overloads that are usually drawn on the power print. And, and uh, that may tell you what they are on the print as far as uh, what type they are and or what their current is. Uh, but on a power print, we get a lot of that information. So uh, as we see these in that power drawing, we need to know what they are and how they function and how they work. When we get into controls, um, boy, we got lots of different symbols that mean lots of different things. And some uh, we're more familiar with than others. But uh, <laughs> our first um, symbol is a normally open push button. So what we know is our abbreviation is NO. We've probably, most of you have probably worked with that for a long time. It tells us it's normally open. So, uh, and it's a momentary push button. That means when I push it down and let it go, it's gonna come right back and open up again. Uh, I think a lot of you, uh, you know, when I think of a, a normally open push button like that, I think of a green start button for a motor. That, that's kind of typical. So I know that as this being in part of my path, no power is gonna go through here. I don't have a path until I close that button, just like we do in, in a start station. So uh, our next one is a normally closed push button. So back to NC for normally closed, it's also momentary. This would be that stop button on that machine uh, or on a particular motor. So when I push it in, I, have, I do not have a path for current to flow. This is also a, a button or a similar button that we would use for an emergency stop. And they usually typically have a mushroom uh, type head on those. And so depending on how new your machinery is, you may have an entire uh, print that just shows the emergency uh, shutdown system on that machine. So there'd be lots of emergency relays and things like that to turn off power, whatnot. Uh, I guess the thing I would tell people is just be, you know, you don't turn a machine off with an e-stop unless it's an emergency. You turn the machine off with a stop button. So when I hit a stop button, that lets the machine go through its normal shutdown sequence. If I hit an e-stop, it doesn't. It stops everything almost all the time, anyhow, depending on the machine. And so I need to know that. Okay? I need to know what stops and what doesn't. So back to knowing your equipment, spending time there. Uh, our next symbol is a normally open limit switch. Everybody works with these, see them all the time. And, uh, but somehow we get confused on uh, some of our symbols. And a lot of our symbols uh, are gravity driven. So when I look at this symbol, gravity keeps it open. Gravity keeps that open. So I need something to push it, whether that's a door or an arm on a piece of machinery or whatever that is to close that contacts so current can flow through there, okay? and. When we, when we get into uh, limit switches, uh, we've got some that confuse people on a regular basis. So this is the one we were just talking about, normally open. And so we've got to push it to close. And then we've got to normally close. And again, gravity is keeping that closed, let, let the path of current flow through there. And I need something to push it open to open up that circuit. Now the two on the next block down here are the confusing ones because this one looks like a normally closed and this one looks like a normally open, but it's not. This is a normally open switch held closed. Uh, you might see uh, uh, maybe a guard has to be in place and there's a limit switch that the guard sits on to make sure that it's there for us to run. Um, uh, a gate on the back of a machine or something like that that has to be closed or the machine doesn't run. So I would have a normally open limit switch held closed by the gate, okay? So what happens I've found on these is when people are in a hurry troubleshooting, 
this looks like a normally closed if I don't pay attention to what side that line is on that circle. Okay. Uh, and the same way with the next one. This guy right here is that one, you know, are the lights on in your refrigerator when the door's closed? Well, guess what? This is the little guy that makes all that happen. So when I close the door, it pushes the limit switch and opens up and turns the lights off. At least I think it does anyhow. And when I open the refrigerator door, it closes and turn the lights on. So what I would tell you is, is that when you're looking at a drawing, these are sometimes confusing and make sure that you realize what side that line is on that circle uh, or you can make a mistake. And uh, it could uh, cost you a lot of time troubleshooting uh, and a lot of downtime and nobody likes downtime. Uh, this is looking at an inside uh, of a limit switch, an IEC. And one of the things that the IEC people do is they number their contacts 13, 14, 21, and 22. We're going to talk about those numbers a little bit later. And they also basically have, back to our abbreviations, is that we have that normally open and normally closed. All right, let's get back to our flow switch here, uh, or a float switch. We people have a lot of float switches uh, in tanks and those kind of things. And uh, some of those switches have normally open and normally closed contacts in the same switch. And so we're back to our typical abbreviation and normally closed, uh, showing us that that's a normally closed. And when the fluid comes in the tank, it's gonna push that float up and open that limit switch. Our next one is actually a pilot light. It's a load, one of those loads that we have. And they're drawn typically that way and a lot of them with a circle and the letter in the center indicates the color of the lens. So in this particular case, we have a green lens on that pilot light. Uh, our other circle usually indicates a coil. In this case, it has a CR in it to stand for control relay. Sometimes they just put R for relay. Sometimes it has T for timer. Uh, but it is coil, and that's typical in our ladder diagrams as well. Our next symbol is a solenoid. Uh, we use lots of solenoids on machinery uh, for air valves, hydraulic valves, and uh, they're letting things, you know, control cylinders and those kind of things to go in and out. Uh, and so this is a load, and this would be at the right side of that drawing. Uh, our next symbol is just a relay contact. And it's a normally open set of contacts. The next one is a normally closed set of contacts and these will be on the drawings, okay? So one of the things you have to understand is that prints are drawn in the de-energized state. So that means without power on them. That means like having a relay in your hand. If it says it's normally open, there's no power applied. And this is very important to you because you have to understand that if you're troubleshooting a machine, more than likely you have the power turned onto that machine. You're troubleshooting it. And so what the drawing shows is normally open, could be closed. That's understanding your machine and how it works and when it does things so that you know Yep, it's, it's a normally open and it shows open on the print, but right now it's closed because that cylinder is pushed out and hit that limit switch or whatever that contact's on, okay? So uh, it's very important to know uh, what they all mean and to understand they're drawn in the de-energized state when I look at that print. Um, I can only think of one or two times I've ever ran across a print that was not drawn in the de-energized mode. That's, very, that's not normal. This is a ladder diagram. This is something that we uh, uh, typically use on machinery. And so <clears throat> we, uh, we have to know how we use this drawing and how it helps us. And, and this is back to, this is that drawing where it doesn't really show us where anything's at. It just shows us the path that the current has to take to make something work. So, uh, it may have termination points on it, and those termination uh, symbols may be different for 
your different drawings. It may be a square, it might be a triangle with a number in it. It, it. It's hard to say, but you'll have to look at your prints and figure that out. Now, a ladder diagram, and we call it a ladder because we have rails on the side. Each side we have a rail, and then we have rungs across. That's since we call it a ladder diagram. And so a ladder diagram is read from top to bottom. That's that's how the sequence of the machine works. And, and the path is from left to right. Okay. So as you can see, we have numbers on both sides. Over here we have red numbers, and these are the rung numbers. So drawings can have many rungs, hundreds of rungs. It depends on how big that drawing is. We're using these to help us locate things. These are locator numbers for us. You don't have rung numbers, it's, it's more difficult. The numbers over here on the right side of the diagram are associated with this load right here. And this is a coil, but it's the motor starter coil. Uh, you may have numbers associated with that motor or not, it's hard to say. But in this case, what we know is that when this coil is energized, these real these contacts on this motor starter all change state. So when it comes to the controls, so here it says that I have a contact on rung two. Here's rung two, and here it is. It's a normally open contact. The next one on rung three with a line under it. The line under the number means that I'm looking for a normally closed contact associated with this coil. So here it is. MS, normally closed, turns the light on. And four is on rung four. So you could have lots of numbers over here. If this was a relay instead of a motor starter, you may have five, six sets of contacts. And what they're gonna try to tell you is, is all the rungs that those contacts are on. So I can go to the rung and I can then easily find uh, the MS, if that's the case, or a number associated with this motor starter. It helps me troubleshoot much faster. So the other thing here is back to our path to current flows is when I look at drawings, right now I only have one path in this whole drawing, and that is the green light. And so if I have power on my, con my control transformer up here, my green light should come on. So that's one of the things you know about machinery is that when I turn on the power, should, should I have lights? Should I not have lights? That, that's why you have to spend time with your equipment to make sure you understand what it does and how it does it so that you should know when you're supposed to have lights and don't have lights. So uh, all, of these, all of these things help us uh, with using a print and identifying where things are. To talk a little bit about IEC prints. A lot of you probably have European equipment. Uh, and so I guess uh, a couple things I would say about uh, European equipment or just because you have European motor starters and limit switches and relays did not necessarily mean the machine came from Europe. Uh, so it makes a big difference uh, because the Europeans uh, think a little bit different than we do and wire different than we do. So if it's a machine that was built in the United States with European equipment, it may not be the same way, wired the same way I'm about to show you. But if it came from Europe, uh, they're, they're very uh, meticulous over there. Uh, and they do things to help you understand and, again, troubleshoot faster. So uh, when I get to a European print, uh, we, we kind of have the opposite thing going for us, is that they read from left to right, top to bottom. And their equipment typically has a number. So if I look at this, this block right here, this square, uh, I've got a number. And if you look at that number, here's that number right over here. So what they're trying to tell me is, is the print group that I'm in. So A7, because this obviously has lots, it has a B print group and a C print group. This particular one is an A. It's telling me the page. So the second set of numbers, 02, tells me that I'm on the second page of that print group. So if you look over here in the corner, you can see that we have an 
arrow that says, okay, the print before this is, is group A7-01, and the print after this is A7-03, and the print I'm on is A7-2, and there's 79 pages. So they're always trying to use their numbering system to get me someplace. An IEC drawing K stands for a contactor or relay. Now, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute, how I know which one is which. Then their rung number is the next number. And I call it a space. Some people call it a rung, uh, but it's a space. And this, this would be a space here. And this could be, you know, rung one. And so everything in there uh, is going to be associated with that one. And the last one is how many loads are in that rung. So the space is quite wide. And sometimes if I need more contacts for whatever that interlocking of the machine is, I may have two squares over here. And that number is gonna be all the same except for the very last digit, which would be a two associating it with that. So when I have contacts off of it and I show them on a, on a print someplace, when I see the two or the one, I know which relay it's associated with, okay? So quite often below the drawing, they're going to have a drawing like this that associates where those contacts are. Now, this one here, this is just a, a, a snippet out of a drawing, but it's showing you that the space, these are all on the same page because it doesn't take me any place. And this is in rung one, this is in rung three, and this is in rung two or space one, space two, or space three. It shows me where all these things are, helps me identify and helps me find them. So here's a symbol for an IEC contact. And most of their contactors allow you to have auxiliary contacts on the side. So in the center here, I'm looking at the main contact. Now, one of the things with European drawings that's very important to understand is that if you notice all of the numbers up here are all odd numbers. These are all odd numbers and that's the source of supply. So when we start talking about European drawings, the odd numbers is where the source is coming into it. Whether that's one limit switch to another limit switch or from one push button to another push button, they're always using, that's why they got those numbers on there. And if you do it like that, you always know where the source to that switch or push button should be. When it comes to their contactors, uh, a little bit different too. One of the things with their contactors uh, is if you notice here up on top, let me get my pointer back out there for you, is that they're single digit numbers. And that tells me it's a contactor right away. So when I looked at that print we had and we've seen those double digit numbers, that was a relay, single digit numbers are contactors. So, and here's my odds again, guys, one, three, and five. Two, four, and six, this is the load side. So load are the even numbers, odd numbers are the source. Up here, I have A1 and A2 for the coil. That's always the numbers that they use. A1 is always gonna be the source or the feed to the coil, and A2 is gonna be that neutral or a negative, okay? So very important uh, to understand that. It helps you troubleshoot, it helps you know where things are coming from. So in this drawing here, you can see that below our, our square here, it shows us that there's a one, three, and five. That's showing us right those that that's power contact. That's the source to this contactor. Here's my load. And this tells me that I have auxiliary contacts on it because they're double digit numbers. And this one tells me that I have it on a different page. This set's going into a different page. So all these numbering schemes are there to take me someplace, okay? Uh, this uh, contactor uh, is for a motor, but it is not a motor starter. The only time we have a motor starter is when the overloads and main contacts are together. I can have a contact and overload. And in, when I get into European drawings, typically the overloads 
are in a manual starter in most of their prints. So I have a manual starter uh, and in here, I can turn it on and off and this is where my thermal overloads are. So I have this, then I have the contactor and then it goes out to the motor. I don't have an overload like you're used to with NEMA motor starters where we have those set of overloads in there. When it comes to those relays, we talked about double digit numbers on our relays and that's the way our, friend, our IEC stuff is, but they're giving you information. And if you notice here that across the top of this relay, we've got 13, 21, 31, 41. Well, the first digit is identifying which contact it is on the relay. So here, this is the first contact. The next 21 is showing me that it's the second contact on the relay and so on. So if you look down here, we're going to three and we're going to four. So they're indicating that. The other thing that's very important is to understand the numbers because if you look over here on the numbers, okay, we're gonna find out that three and four mean normally open. When you see the numbers three and four on an IEC push button, that means it's normally open or on a contact block. When you see one and two, it means it's normally closed. That's the system that they use to help identify where things are and what, what, what they are. So instead of an abbreviation, they're using a number to tell you the same thing. So instead of an NO, I'm getting a one and a two. So if you look over here, this particular one, I've got 13, so I got three and a four. And that tells me that's a normally open circuit. Even if I can't read it up here, tell that's what I know it is. And the other one is a 21 and a 22. And I know one and two means that it's closed. So I know it's the first contact on the relay, the second contact, the third and the fourth. And over here is my coil, A1 and A2. Always that on European stuff. Symbols are a little bit different on our European stuff, um, but uh, typically you can go online and you can find something that compares them. Their nomenclature is the same. They're still using an NC and an NO, uh, but here's those numbers, one and two, three and four. So this is the limit switch with those same numbers on it. Three and four open, one and two closed. Back to our little schedule up here. And as we go through all of these, our foot switches, same thing, we get, we get this three and four, one and two. So that looks different than our symbols, uh, but uh, it, you know, uh, if you come to one of our class and get a reference guide, guess what? You get these symbols. Uh, our relay contacts, again, NCNO, same, same thing, but they're showing you there's nothing device. So this is a relay contact and an IEC relay is how it's gonna be drawn on the print. Here, they're just putting a P in here to let us know that pressure. Now they're not, we don't know whether it's water pressure or air pressure, but it's pressure that operates, makes this switch function and changes these contacts. There's that mushroom head we talked about uh, up front and a different symbol, but there's, that tells us right up front that that is a, E stop. And we have our momentary push button here. Uh, overload contacts. Um, they get a different set of numbers because they're special purpose, but five and six means closed on special purpose uh, contacts. Our contactor coil said A1 and A2 are always what makes it operate, and A1 is always the source through the logic down to and A2 is always a negative uh, or the neutral, okay? Pilot light, uh, they're a little bit different on how they do theirs, but they got a little X through there and they will typically tell you what the color is, but it is also an A1 and an A2. Okay, so here's a drawing that looks just like the drawing we looked at at the very beginning uh, before, when we got started, our first ladder diagram but this is an IEC ladder diagram. So we're talking about left to right, 
top to bottom. And there's these spaces. So this is space one or rung one, space two, space three. And in a European drawing, this particular contact right here is the overload contact. So from that manual starter we talked about, this is that contact. So uh, it's going to open up if you have an overload on that motor and shut this circuit down. So then we go through our, uh, our stop button. There's that one and two again. And typically we don't show this line here, but over here is the start button. And this is the uh, contact on the auxiliary contact on the motor starter, the holding or the sealing circuit. But they show it this way because that is the normal path. The normal path is not through here because we know this is a momentary switch. And so once we push the switch and close this and energize this coil, this contact closes and that is the path. Here's the information on all the things associated with this contactor. So we have auxiliary contacts on here, double digit numbers again, showing us the first set, the second set, and the third set. And then here it's showing us that the actual main contacts that's running the motor are way over in the group B set of prints. Hey, Marty, this might give me a great segue into one of the questions we're getting um, on the Q&A line. And that is that that coil that says a7-02k11 um yes. there's th there's three components in that same rung that have the exact same number why is that because they're all associated with contacts off of that back to when it is energized the state of all of those change and i need to know that so if you notice down below that square down here it says that <clears throat> this this set of contacts here is right here it's in rung one there it is, that set right there. This set here is on rung three. There it is, that's a, that pilot light. And this set is in rung two, which is right here. And so I'm, I'm getting that so I know that they're all associated with the same number. When I energize this right here, all of these change state. This entire group changes state. Gotcha. And how do you feel about taking some more questions here uh, about some schematics? Well, I'm, I'm good. Let's do it. Um, so we're getting some really great questions coming in, y'all. And um, and by the way, th this is just an hour session, as you know. There's so much to cover. There's so many different symbols. And really, um, there there's only so much we can do in one hour. So so highly recommend you take the full schematics class uh, that we offer. It's a whole two day class and lots of different schematics we're gonna be getting through here. But let's see if we can answer some schematic questions here while we have you for the next few minutes. Okay. Um, what is, um, this is an interesting one. Is a float switch a limit switch? What do you think? No, it's a switch, but it's a float switch. Limit switch is one that we think of that sits out there and it has an arm and something you know, contacts that arm and opens or closes the switch. That's a limit switch. It is a switch, it's just a different type of switch. It's a float switch that's gonna be in liquid. A limit switch doesn't go in liquid. Got you. Um, thank you so much for that question, you all. Oh, here's another great one that came in on the Q&A line for you, Marty. Um, are there only NEMA and IEC standards or are there more, for, for instance, in China or Russia or other countries? Uh, most of the other countries, the European countries, somewhat use the IEC standard, but not all of them. I, I mean, I can just tell you that um, the more you pay for engineering on a, on a machine, the better prints you're going to get. And a lot of people save money on, on prints to get a cheaper machine. Mm. Yeah, definitely. It's a... Uh... It, you realize when they're not following the standards, uh, when the when the symbols tend to just be whatever they want them <laughs> to be. Um, what should be the industry standard for symbols? I think I can help kind of field that. It really it really depends on which standards that that those folks are following in the in North America. It's the NEMA, the IEC, um, international. But you can follow basically whatever standard applies to you, the application you're working on. Yeah, as um, I was telling you in the beginning. Um, if it's wired in the United States mm -hmm. uh, and they're using European uh, devices, more than likely it's not going to be 
wired per the IEC standard uh, because very few people in the United States know and truly understand IEC drawing. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, let's see. Um, here's some really good, yeah, really good questions coming in. Thank you all very much. We're going to try to take as many as we can in the next five minutes before the top of the hour, and then we'll definitely honor your hour here together. So thank you so much for being here. Um, let's go with the whole idea of a, a schematic being drawn for electron flow versus hole flow. Is the schematic written for more electron flow or holes? And does it not matter, maybe? I guess I'm not under sure what's H-O-L-E, hole? Yeah, what? holes. Uh, I guess the, the opposite uh, flow of electrons. So are we are they showing the flow of electrons or the flow yes. of the, the space of electrons? The yeah, space we're, we're showing the flow. Yeah, I would I would agree too. Um, it and I guess it really depends on which which uh, what's the word which um, mechanic you're using. Whether people believe it's the electrons flowing or the holes, but that we'll leave that to the physicists yes, and yes, the yes. scientists. But but for us, we, we care about kind of the we, real world. Talk about current flow, the path the current takes to energize the device. Yes, absolutely. Um, so what is a special purpose contactor? I think we had mentioned that once. Uh, yeah, uh, caller well, was asking. That's, in the, that, that's something the, that the Europeans use. And so that tells me that it's on an overload. Uh, that's a special mm. pur purpose contact. Or uh, that uh, manual motor starter, those are special purpose contact. But all the other ones, as we look at the ones with the single digits and the numbers we've used, those are just your normal contacts around relays and contact. So just by looking at the numbers, I know exactly what it's on. I know that the double digits are relays, uh, and I know that the single digits are a contactor, and they can handle you know large large amount of current. Gotcha. Um, I think we got just a couple time for a couple more. Obviously, sorry we can't get to all these questions, but I'm going to try to summarize them the best I can. Uh, let's see. Um, for PLCs, uh, so if we're looking at a schematic for a PLC, um, is PLC programming with ladder logic something worth learning? And is it offered in TPC courses for, for schematics? Well, of course, the answer is it offered by TPC. Yes, it is. Um, we do talk about uh, PLC ladder logic in our uh, schematics class. Um, a lot of the older machines, and when I say older, still into the 2000s, are still programmed in ladder logic. A lot of the newer machines are not. So uh, yes, you need to know it uh, in PLC ladder logic uh, to be able to help you troubleshoot. Got you. And a um, couple of chatters about the whole <laughs> whole idea of between holes and, and electrons, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna leave that one there because it, we, I think we're gonna care about the electron. It really helps us to visualize from from the electron uh, flow point of view. Um, could a tool interlock? Uh, let's see. Could it could a limit switch be used for a tool interlock? Sure. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. That would be a whether yeah, it's normally closed or open depends, right? Yeah, I mean, you're just saying that if something's not in a position that you can't operate something, and then when it's put in the right position, then it will operate. Mm -hmm. And how do you determine, uh, a, call, a caller is asking about, um, how do you determine if a uh, drawing we're looking at it was energized or not? Well, uh, if, it's an in, if it's drawn in the energized mode, uh, it will say on the print, but if it says nothing, I'm going to assume that it's drawn in the de-energized mode. Mm, good call. Excellent. And um, we'll definitely be sending you that follow-up info that a few of you have requested. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I think the only other question we have is, um, is CAD software, so yeah, computer-aided design software, um, is it helpful with this numbering of the diagram elements or not so much? Um, is it helpful? Any numbering is helpful because uh, you get so many drawings that have no numbering, but um, most uh, machine manufacturers, uh, uh, I hate to say ones that are maybe more expensive, 
you get a significant numbering system where every num every number on a wire means something. And uh, that again helps you troubleshoot. Uh, you get into some machines that are so large that you need two or three PLCs to make it run. So back to my numbering scheme, I can't have three wires with the same input or output. Mm. They have to be numbered then. Certainly. Well, thank you all so much for your questions. Uh, got a lot of great ones coming in. Feel free to reach out to us again. Um, Marty, if you want to flip to our number real quick so people can j jot it down, 847-808-4000. Uh, call us back. Uh, we can talk more schematics with you. We love talking with you, uh, our instructors, myself, Marty, you might chat with us. And uh, sales at tpctraining.com is our main uh, email box for, for you to chat with us as well. So jot that down. Uh, take a look at this. You're going to see this again within two business days on our website. And this recording will be available there for free and to watch back as many times as you like with your colleagues. So thanks again. Look out for that email with the recording link and we will see you all soon. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody.